before our next speaker, um, you know, while we've had many talks today using words to express grief, as we examine the myriad aspects of grief, we often find that we don't have the words to express our feelings. To help us explore those times, I have the pleasure of introducing my dear friend, Gail Karen Young-White as our next speaker. Gail is a culture builder and a catalyst for human and organizational de development, though that barely begins to capture Gail. I've known Gail for over a decade now, and I remember when we first met how she was deeply uh, contempla contemplative of the two sides of the coin of grief and praise. I was an engineer at the time and had little exposure to people who expressed these kinds of thoughts or to people who have poetry as readily accessible as Gail. So these insights were fascinating to me. For me, Gail personifies the holding of both simplicity and complexity. She can be constantly misplacing her keys while on the same time masterfully facilitating large groups of executives. And I love that she embraces silliness and absurdity with the enthusiasm while at the same time embodying deep soulful wisdom. To say that Gail has a way with words is a grand understatement. Gail has always been able to express thoughts and feelings with a grace that I'm always astounded by. Today, she will be bringing words and language to something that is so often hard to speak to and reflect on how poetry can be of service in the effort to name something that feels ineffable and intangible and often overwhelming. I'm honored to introduce Gail to speak to the poetics of grief. I'm just having a good laugh because it is appallingly true how frequently I misplace my keys. Um, Thank you, Shing, and also to Ivy for being part of the lineage today. I'm Chinese American, born in the Philippines, immigrant, undocumented until I was almost 30 years old. So thank you, Ivy, for um, sharing your pain and also naming mine. And this speaks to why it's so important to name publicly, to make it accessible, to share it, to widen um, the touch points between us and human, other human beings through presence and language. The oldest poem that we have access to is a lamentation, a poem of grieving inscri inscribed in cuneiform into a clay tablet that dates back over 4,000 years to ancient Sumer. It's over 400 lines long and in the voice of a goddess who weeps for her city, the goddess Nengal. And I find it fascinating, a lot of these ancient lamentations occurred in the feminine voice. They exist in all cultures, in the Hindic Vedas, in ancient Chinese texts, in Shakespeare, in opera, in the Iliad, in the Odyssey. And these laments are said to be the sound of trauma. Trauma itself given voice and also memory. One of the lines that stood out from this ancient lamentation is the goddess saying, my step, my step established for joy was scorched like an oven. These lamentations are often deeply placed in land. I think that's fascinating because one thing I learned in holding my own grief is the capacity of the earth and all that she has seen to hold all our grief. My step established for joy was scorched like an oven. These words from 4,000 years ago are not so different from the more contemporary words by Lois Red Elk of Montana who writes and our blood remembers, the day the earth wept a quiet wind covered the lands weeping softly like an elderly woman shawl over bowed head. So I began uh, to understand the role of poetry and language through the doorway of my own grief. I was driving cross country in the midst of a divorce, in the midst of incredible heartbreak, and a friend left on my answering machine these words by Rainer Maria Rilke. He said, it is possible that I am pushing through solid rock like a vein of ore encased. And I'm so far in, I see no end and no distance. Everything is close to my face and everything close to my face is stone. I am not yet wise in my grief, so this great darkness makes me small. But if it's you, make yourself fierce and break in, and then your great transforming will happen to me and to you, the fullness of my cry. 
I am not yet wise in my grief, so this great darkness makes me small. Something in those lines helped me turn toward grief, not away from. To fear it a little less and to feel kinship with this dead poet who found the words that I didn't even know to say that gave my grief contours. This poem helped invite me into my own group. I'm like, who is this guy? How do I find him? How do I find other words like him? I invite those of you on the line to use the chat function to name other poets, lines, words that have helped you in times of grief. I often get asked what poetry I turn to. This poem helped me be present to my grief and it unlocks something. As Rose Hugh Joan Halifax said earlier, the words cannot be a substitute for presence, but I think poetry can invite us into presence. It gives us shape of grieving so we can enter it and it can help us bear witness. Those ancient and modern lamentations help us bear witness. I think of I can't breathe, George Floyd's last words that have been etched in many lamentations of him and of the wider injustice we are called to bear witness to. Eli Wazel in his Nobel lecture on memory, referring on the biblical figure of Job said, he demonstrated a faith essential to rebellion and that hope is possible beyond despair. The source of his hope must be memory as it must be ours. Because I remember, I despair. Because I remember, I have the duty to reject despair. I remember the killers, I remember the victims, even as I struggle to invent a thousand and one reasons to hope. Poetry and grief are entwined because the poetic voice, the lament is the sound of trauma, is the voice of expression of grief, invocation of memory, individual and collective, and it guides us into and through grief all at once. The invitation to fullness in grief makes sense to me. I'm gonna um, adapt these words from Franz Kafka. You can hold back from the suffering of the world. You can hold back from the grief of the world and you have permission to do so. And it is in accordance with your nature. But perhaps this very holding back is the one suffering you could have avoided. It takes energy to hold back. It takes energy to dam it up. And sometimes what we dam up can feel so overwhelming that we don't want to enter it. But then we miss that what we mourn and how we mourn may also be worth the fullest expression of what we can bring to it. You know, I think poetry aids us in creating a context for grieving so that we can do it wisely. Shing talked about, I've been long um, obsessed with Michael Mead and his words on grief and praise. And he said, grief is praise for what we've lost and praise is grief for what we have. Now that's a Zen koan for you. But this notion that we praise and we grieve because we love, that we take the time to honor what we grieve, ourselves, our loved ones, our own fullness, the scale of institutional and societal harm, the lamentations that stretch all the way back into our earliest history and across every culture. You miss and you grieve because you love. We love and thus we get to grieve. There's this line from um, Galway Canal when he's writing in this poem called Little Sheep's Head Sprouting Hair in the Moonlight. When I come back, we will go out together. We will walk together among the 10,000 things, each scratched in time with such knowledge that the wages of dying is love. The wages of dying is love. These lines are things that the mind can't grasp, but the embodied heart knows. And I think poetry also teaches about the journey to holding loss as part of the cycles of life, to grieve more wisely, as Roshi Joan Halifax said in the beginning of our conversation. I love Mary Oliver because she teaches so much. And she writes in this poem in Blackwater Woods, Every year, everything I have ever learned in my lifetime leads back to this. The fires and the black river of loss whose only, whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us will ever know. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, 
to hold it against your bones, knowing that your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, let it go. The irony is that loss and death and finiteness is what teaches us about life and the infinite. And it also, I think poetry teaches us about grief as the doorway into compassion, into the way that this experience that can be so isolating and can feel so alone in grieving can actually touch the universal. Naomi Shihab Nye writes in her poem on kindness, that before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved. All this must go so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. Before you know kindness is the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches a thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. I think about that in my work with activists. Speaking to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. I think of the mother Mary captured in her great grief, you know, those forms of her in Pieta holding her son and how her grieving form speaks to all mothers and her own kinship to um, my deity, Kuan Yin, and her compassion with her thousand eyes and arms to take in and observe all the sounds and suffering in the world. Roshi Joan Halifax talked this morning about the gifts of grieving. I had a beloved friend and mentor who passed away and I was sitting, you know those moments when you hear of loss and you know exactly where you were sitting. And he had a tagline on his email that says, nothing left ungiven. He wanted to have given so much in his life that there was nothing left to miss because there was nothing left ungiven. And uh, something in the way of his passing acted like a great spotlight or the way that um, a great illumination happens and throws the rest of the world into stark relief. Just like if you've ever experienced the light during a solar eclipse, it's super weird. Everything's the same and yet, it's different, the cars are there, the trees are there, but the light is different. And I think great grief illuminates with a certain kind of clarity, if you can lean into it. It helps in grieving and poetry that I'm married to a poet. Um, my husband is a poet, David White, and I evoke some of his words from the poem, The Well of Grief. Those who will not slip beneath the still surface on the well of grief, turning down through its black water to the place we cannot breathe. We'll never know the source from which we drink, the secret water cold and clear, nor find in the darkness glimmering the small round coins thrown by those who wished for something else. I've experienced my depression my whole life. It's one of my doorways into psychology and um, I think depression is sometimes a sane response to the craziness of this universe. And how much I spent trying to paddle to stay at the surface, the kind of dog paddling and the desperation to not sink. And how much I would have missed if I'd never learned to make the turning, um, to sink below and to find out what's there. What's the source that's there? What's the commonality? And what are the bigger things that hold that and hold us in that? So poetry has been a core part of my own resilience practice. It has been a teacher, a shaper, an invitation. And it's taught me to trust the part of me that knows deeply because myself and my ancestors of every generation have had to hold grief. And we have allies that we don't even know we have in the earth and the sky and in language and in our bodies. You know, one of the funny things about being in grief is that um, it requires a kind of, I don't really have words for this. Uh, I think poetry is great at attempting the ineffable. Um, but I related best to those people who related to me, both in my wholeness and in my brokenness. You know, 
if you related to me as I was completely okay, that missed a core thing, a core piece of what I was um, carrying. But if you related to me as though I was only broken, that also missed something. And so there's a, a duality that we are sometimes asked to hold, which can be difficult in grief, um, to have a relationship with it, to be of it and to be witness to it at the same time. And so I wanna end my words with these uh, words again by Raina Maria Rilke, this call to have a relationship to grief in a different way, a connective tissue, um, to grief. And he writes, be ahead of all parting as if it had already happened. Like winter, which even now is passing. For beneath the winter is a winter so endless that to survive it at all is a triumph of the heart. Be forever dead in Eurydice and climb back singing. Climb back singing, climb praying as you return to connection. Here among the disappearing in the realm of the transient, be a ringing glass that shatters it as it rings. There's an invocation in that poem to have a relationship with the death and the dying, but also a relationship to life itself. Be, and at the same time, know what it is to not be. The non-being inside you allows you to vibrate in full resonance with your world. Use it for once. To all that has run its course and to the vast and sayable numbers and beings abounding in nature, add yourself gladly and cancel the cost. Thank you for letting me share some of the words that have guided me. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the inspiration the global voices, the resilience practices, the perspectives, the rituals, the different relationships to brief that are more and more available to us. And I'm so grateful um, to add my voice to the conversation. It's a voice that's added very gladly. Thank you, Shing. Thank you to the speakers before me and after me. Thank you so much for giving us words for the ineffable and expressible. And thank you to the audience as well for sharing the poems and words that move you. Um, we will be gathering the sharings for a post-summit mailing. So don't worry if you miss them in the chat as they went by.